speed at verse 14. This is some of the most powerful parts of the Word of God. It has a wallop and a punch. It has a tremendous power, a force, a driving force for our lives. Listen as I read. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? You can hear the sneer in his voice. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. But if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He had a pretty healthy respect for these boys, didn't he? And then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They weren't made out of the right kind of stuff. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said to his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their head seams, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other god that can deliver after this sort. Let every head be bowed, please. Thank you. Heavenly Father, with all the reverence and faith of my soul tonight, I come in the presence of the Lord God Almighty. I come not in my name, but in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, thine only begotten Son. Honor now the ministry and the prayer of thy humble servant, and grant this mighty miracle tonight, the presence of and the power of God to set men free. Fill this great auditorium from roof to floor, wall to wall, with the power of Jesus of Nazareth. O oh Lord, rebuke the devil's power. Cast out demon spirits. Subdue the wicked forces that bind and torment humanity. And set the people free. O oh God, rebuke Satan's awful power. And now, devil, 
I come against you tonight, not in my strength or in my name, but in the strength and through the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I charge you, devil, take your hands off God's property and loose every man, every woman, every child in this great audience. Loose them, devil. I charge you by my Lord, loose them and let them go free. God cast him out. Fill this auditorium with the angels of God. Oh, may they walk these aisles tonight. May they hold us in their hands, O oh Lord. May this be the hour when the presence of God shall take this campaign over. God, let people be healed while I preach. Let people be saved while I preach. Let people's habits be broken while I preach. And, O oh Lord, destroy the works of the devil and set people free tonight. Now, Father, I thank you because you've heard me pray. Because I come in the name that's above every name, the mighty and comparable name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of the living God. Amen. I speak to you tonight on the fourth man. Like a sparkling diamond on a velvet couch, the city of Jerusalem was situated by God the exact geographical center of this earth. There he dwelt among his people. There they builded a temple for his glory and honor and worship. On its altars were sacrificed animals, pure and without blemish. Their blood shed an offering made for the forgiveness of the people's sins. Through the streets of Jerusalem walked the old prophets of God, thundering their prophecies, uttering their messages of truth, calling their people back to the paths of holiness and righteousness before God. From Jerusalem went the law of God to the ends of the earth, and there his name was praised and honored and glorified. Far away from Jerusalem, toward the south and east, was another city, the greatest the pride and skill of man have ever built. Babylon was built on a great mountain of rock. Its walls were 300 feet high and wide enough at the top for eight chariots to run races side by side. Inside the walls was the famous heathen temple, Bel, whose spires towered above the walls 300 feet, and on its altars were offered animals to appease the wrath of heathen gods. And once the animals had been strangled to death, offered on the altars of the temple to heathen gods. The meat was sold to the butchers of Babylon, who in turn sold it to cost the counter to the Babylonian housewives. This explains why Daniel and his companions put their foot down, pushed their plate back, got up and said, We will not defile ourselves with the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank because their religion forbade their eating meat which had come from an animal strangled to death and whose body had been offered to idol gods. Winding its way through Babylon was the beautiful Euphrates River, which added much to the wondrous beauty of Babylon. Here also was built the famous Hanging Gardens, one of the wonders of the ancient world, which Nebuchadnezzar built for the pride and vanity of his worldly wife. Here was the famous palace, of Nebuchadnezzar, the proudest man who ever sat on an earthly throne. This palace was eight or seven miles around, being more like a fortress than a palace. Nebuchadnezzar had taken his victorious armies and marched across the known earth and captured the nations of the world. He had brought back to Babylon many of its people, and in consequence of his wars, he had brought their gods. For what was strange to Nebuchadnezzar was the weakness and the utter lack of power of the gods of this world. They were made in the likeness of four-footed beasts, some in the likeness of the fowls of the air, some in the likeness of men, some grotesque and ugly and crude, others brilliant and beautiful and skillfully made. But none of them had power to deliver their people. And once Nebuchadnezzar had captured the people, he also captured their gods and brought them back to Babylon with him. 
He had a vast stockpile of gods, gods of every known description, but gods you could not see, nor hear, nor feel, nor had no power to set their people free. And so when he saw all these gods lifeless, laying at his feet, he said, there's no God in the world but me. No God could withstand my march, my relentless power. So he had his men to fashion a golden image, a reproduction of himself, his own image, of pure and solid gold. It stood a hundred feet high at the edge of the city on the plains of Dura. And when he saw that this God was made, he concocted a terrible plan so that he would know whether or not people were worshiping him. At the sound of music throughout all the world, people were to bow and face themselves toward the image of Nebuchadnezzar, clasp their hands, chant this praise, Great is Nebuchadnezzar our God. Great is Nebuchadnezzar our God. There was one city and one land untouched by the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, the land of Judea, where Jerusalem was. One day he took his conquering legions and marched across the hot burning sands of the desert and besieged the city of God, the great king. In process of time with their old battering rams, they tore the walls down, went inside and burned the temple, sacked the city and left it in smoldering ruins. As trophies of his victory, he led away captive the very flower of the nation, fine young Hebrew men like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, and others. See these young men. As they stand on one of the hills overlooking their ruined city and hear them say, O oh, Jerusalem, O oh, Jerusalem, if we ever forget thee, let our right hand forget its cunning, let our tongue cleave to the roof of our mouths. See them again as they pass inside the walls of the fabulous city of Babylon. See them as they gather on the banks of Euphrates River and hang their harps on the willows and hang their heads in sorrow. See the curious Babylonians as they come to gaze upon them and hear them say, sing for us some of the songs of Zion. Play for us on your instruments. And hear these melancholy words, how can we sing the songs of our God in a strange land? And they refuse to do it. But hardly had they become accustomed to the splendor of their new surroundings until they heard all kinds of music, trumpets and cornets and flutes and what have you. And to their astonishment, every Babylonian they saw and stranger in town was bowing on his face and chanting praises, Great is Nebuchadnezzar our God. Seeing the reflection of the golden image, their blood recalled in their veins, for written in the law of God, thou shalt not bow down to any graven image. Thou shalt not worship any idol god. And these young men stood still, their blood freezing in their veins, standing upright with their face toward God in his heaven. There were informers, spies in the land. They came to the king and told him the story, who ushered these young men in his presence and demanded them either to fall down and worship his image or he would cast them alive into a burning, fiery furnace. And he said, then who will be that God that will deliver you out of my hands? These young men came face to face with one of life's inescapable facts. True religion will be tried. A man who is going to heaven is going to face some opposition along the way. A man who is living for God will be hated by the devil. His religion will be tried. Friends, you have got to understand one thing if you want to make a success of your faith. You are not going to have an easy time with the devil. You are not going to have an easy time with the devil. You are not going to have an easy time with the devil. A young lady got up one night and came down the aisles in our meeting and gave her heart to Jesus Christ. She was flushed with joy. Her face shone like the face of an angel. She went back and sat down beside her boyfriend and took his hand and said, The Lord has just saved me. I never knew what it was until tonight to be saved. And I want you to come with me and give your heart to Jesus too. 
and he up and laughed in her face. She didn't know what to expect from him. She thought that he would want to come. And she was astonished to find that he was mocking her. And he sat there and poked fun at her. Every time she'd ask him to come, he'd mock her. Finally, she saw that he meant it. And she knew she had something in her heart that the world couldn't give and the world couldn't take away. And she turned to him and said, All right, if you won't go to heaven with me, I'm not going to hell with you. I received quite a bit of mail from people whose loved ones get saved in my meetings, some of whom go back and backslide. A lot of people get saved in every revival. That's all right if they happen to die during a revival. But if they were to die between revivals, most of them would lose their souls. But some of these people come up, especially some men who are in and out and who have worried their wives all these years, their wives begging them to get right and stay right, and their wives being a crutch to them and holding them up and hoping and praying that they'll stand true this time. I received a letter from a certain lady who said, Brother Roberts, my husband been saved so many times, she said. In and out. And he came to your meeting and got saved, and I thought, sure, this time he'd stay saved. And he did for a few months. But now he's got cold and won't go to church and, and won't pay his tithes and won't pray and doesn't get much out of life anymore. Brother Roberts, I was thinking if you'd let him join your party and travel with you that he'd probably stay saved. And I thought to myself, my brother, sister, I need somebody with me who's a soldier, not a coward. I need somebody up here on the firing line where the bullets are whizzing by and the bombs are bursting who's got faith in God, who will stand when the going gets rough. And furthermore, if the man doesn't live right at home, he won't live right abroad. If you can't stay saved in your own church, you probably won't stay saved in the middle of this great campaign. Religion is not a thing of environment, it's a thing of the heart. Religion is an experience with God, something you feel, something you know you've got, something that you experience yourself. It's a set of principles. It's a deep power within your own spirit that connects you with God. It's your own decision to go to heaven. It's your decision to choose God over the devil, faith over unbelief. Salvation over sin, heaven over hell, faith over fear, yes, power over strength, joy over sadness, love over hate. Religion is a choice, a decision to live the good life, to have right principles, to keep the Sabbath day holy, to shoot square with God and your fellow man, to support the work of God, to live decent and honest, and to do those things pleasing in God's sight, and to live a spiritual life devoted to God, practicing your faith seven days a week. That's what salvation is. It isn't something that's without you, it's something within you. Something from within your own heart. And you have to make up your mind if that's what you want. You can come and make a decision to get saved four million times, if that would be possible, but unless your decision is for heaven and God, and right living, you'll never live your salvation. You've got to want what God is. And if you don't want what God is, you won't like what you've got in your soul when you leave this building tonight. You've got to want what is right. And I've said for a long time that you can't get saved until you want to get saved, and you'll never live for God until you want to live for God. You've got to examine yourself and see what you've got inside. If you believe that, say amen. amen. I am saved tonight because I want to be saved. I am going to heaven because I want to go to heaven. I am living right because I've got right within me. I live right because it's natural for me to live right. It's in my soul to do right. And folks, if it isn't in you, you can't put it on. It's got to be in here. Amen. I wish I could get that across. I wish I could get you to see tonight, as I'd like to get everybody to see, that old-time religion is a desire to live right. You've got to want to do it. You've got to want to do it. You've got to want to do it. You know, I'm going to heaven. You know why? Because heaven is in me. I stand for what heaven stands for. It stands for what I stand for. There's harmony between me and God. There's harmony between me and heaven. So then, when my religion is tried, I've already made up my mind what I'm going to do. 
I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to live right. I don't know the experiences I face. I just know the outcome. I know that by God's help, I'm going to be doing right. Now, that's what old-time religion is. And here's why I'm going to heaven. And I'm telling you this because you have to make up your mind whether you want to go to heaven or not. And if you don't want to go to heaven, you probably will never stay saved. A lot of things enter into a man's decision to get old-time religion. If he's satisfied with this world, with the way things are run, with corruption and politics and sin and disease and fear and distrust and hate and sickness and devils and demons, then he'll not want to go to heaven. But if he wants to go to heaven, he's going to come to God and square the old account and make his decision, get on the right side, wave goodbye to the world, and go through. That's the way it goes. I'm going to heaven for many reasons. One of them is this. Only heaven stands for what I stand for. Only heaven stands for what I stand for. I stand for Bible deliverance, for liberation in soul, mind, and body. I stand for the deliverance of God to set your soul free, your mind free, and your body free. Strong bodies for strong souls. Strong bodies for strong souls. Strong bodies for strong souls. This world doesn't stand for that. Only heaven stands for that. Heaven is a kingdom of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And the happiest person in the world is a man who's been set free in soul, mind, and body. Joy in the Holy Ghost. I'm going to heaven because only heaven will satisfy the outreach of my soul. I shall be satisfied when I wake in his likeness. I shall never be satisfied until I see God for myself. There's a longing in my heart tonight, in the heart of every child of God, to see the Lord who has saved us and redeemed us from this world. Isn't that right? People, you have an outreach. You have a desire in your soul. Only heaven would satisfy that. And third, I'm going to heaven because only heaven will finish my work. Only heaven will finish the ministry of deliverance I'm trying to carry on for the glory of God tonight. I have the most unfinished ministry on the earth tonight. It is an unfinished ministry. It isn't being done like it ought to be done. When I think of my unfinished sermons, I know you hear me preach a couple of hours, you say your sermon is finished, but really it isn't. My sermons are not finished until people are delivered. I think of my unfinished prayers, of these unfinished miracles. I think of the unfinished ministry of deliverance itself. Many of you come here and you get sold on deliverance. You think it's beautiful and you give your life for it tonight because you're here with folks who believe it. It's easy to believe it here because others believe it and I believe it. We're all together here. But many of you go home and you don't finish up what you began in this auditorium. Some of you get a touch from God in your soul. In a few weeks, you've lost it. Some of you received healing in your body. In a few weeks, it slipped through your fingers. Some of you have gotten a new slant on life. In a few months, it's gone with the wind. You have only a memory. Thousands of people come to our meetings and get helped. And in a matter of months, they have only a memory left. Some of them drift back to old formal churches where they fight the power of God. They haven't got the courage and backbone to step out where the power of God is really preached. So what they find here becomes a memory to them in just a little while. People, if you don't finish it, nobody will. If you don't finish the work in your own heart, nobody will. If you believe God, you have to believe God all the way. Not just tonight, but the rest of your life. If you believe it, say amen. amen. People, I'm going to heaven because heaven's going to finish. It's going to preach these sermons I'm preaching and preach them until they're preached. It's going to finish my prayers and finish my believing. Only heaven will finish the ministry of deliverance that I have tried to do in this world. And the final reason I'm going to heaven is because God's there. I've been working for him a long time and someday I'd like to sit down and talk it all over with him. <laughs> I'm going to heaven because God's up there and he'll rest me from my labors. These young men faced the old king. He demanded them to bow down. If they didn't, he'd throw them into a burning fire furnace. What will these young men say? How will they react? Their lives are in danger. They can feel the hot breath of a furnace heated seven times hot. They look in the face of a wrathful king and see his red countenance. They see him not his fist. They see him make his laws. What can they do? What can they say? 
He sidles up and he says, boys, you better be careful how you make your decision today. I've been all over this world and I've captured all the gods that I could find. And he said, incidentally, boys, when I got up to Jerusalem, I couldn't find your God. I hunted for him. I even burned your temple down and couldn't find him. In fact, I just don't believe you have one. If you do, you sure can't see him. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar stood there waiting for an answer. Shadrach turned to Abednego and Meshach and he said, Boys, he may not be able to see him, but you can sure feel him. What did they say? They turned and said, Oh, king, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter, but if it be so, our God whom we serve is able. He is able to deliver us out of thine hand. Oh, my brother, he's able. Let weakness lie left on God's shoulders. He's able. Let the angels sing it from heaven. Our God is able. Let the preachers proclaim it from their pulpits. Our God is able. Let the saints shout it from their churches and homes. Our God is able. Let them throw Paul and Silas into prison. Our God is able. When they sing and pray at midnight, he'll shake the place like a rat terror shakes a mouse, and they will be set free. Our God is able. Let them throw Daniel in the lion's den. Our God's able. He'll reckon his directions, turn his face toward Jerusalem, offer his prayer to God, pillow his head in the shaggy mane, the lion, lie down and sleep like a baby all night, for our God's able, watching over him all night long, padlock in each lion's chin. People, our God is able tonight. He has been able. He is able. He will be able. He did deliver. He does deliver. He will deliver. He is a God of deliverance. If you believe it, say amen. amen. But they said, if not, if God does not see fit to deliver us, we bleach our bones in your furnace. There's one thing we have to say to you, O king. We may burn in your fiery furnace, but we will not bow to your idol God. They said we may burn, but we won't bow. But the truth is, boys, if you don't bow, you can't burn. There's a law tonight, a law of faith that's stronger than tides and time. And that law is if you don't bow, you cannot burn. And the law of compromise is if you bow, you will burn. If you don't bow, you can't burn. But if you do bow, you will burn. Say after me these words, if you don't bow, you can't burn. If you don't bow, you can't burn. Twice more. If you don't bow, you can't burn. If I don't bow, I can't burn. But if you bow, you will burn. Say it. Twice more. If I bow, I will burn. The law of faith and the law of compromise. The law of faith is if you don't bow, you can't burn. The law of compromise is if you bow, you will burn. These boys said, King, we may burn in your furnace, but we'll not bow to your God. This is the law of faith. Why is it so strong and invincible? Because faith connects you with God, and God is eternal. Brother, faith is the only indestructible left in this world of destructibles. There's only one thing that won't perish, and that's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you refuse to bow, you stood on your feet because you have faith that God will take care of you. And in believing that, you cannot burn, for there's no power that can destroy faith, no fire can burn it. No water can drown it. No evil power can take it away. It's as old as God is. It's as young as God is. It's as real as God is. It's as imperishable as God is. It makes you as indestructible as God is. If you don't bow, you cannot burn. But on the other hand, if you bow, if you compromise, you will burn. People, if you compromise to get something, you lose what you compromise to get. There's a law in this world, and it's stronger than you and I are. And if we bow our knee, if we refuse to stand for what's right, if we surrender our convictions, if we bow, we're going to burn. Sure as you live. If you compromise the law of tithing, if you keep the one-tenth dollar for yourself, which is God's property, you will lose that dollar. You'll do it. And here's how you'll do it. In fact, you'll lose more than the dollar, and here is why. When you compromise your tithe, which is the Lord's, you're selfish because you want it all for yourself. You don't care anything about God or his work. 
You don't care whether the soul to go to heaven or go to hell. That's exactly how it is in the face of God when you rob God with your tithes. So now, when you refuse to pay your tithes, you've compromised. You compromise the Bible. You compromise your convictions. For everybody knows he ought to share what he's got with God's work. Everybody knows that. Not a person in this audience who doesn't know that tonight. Right? We all know that to be true. But if we compromise it, you know what happens? We get more selfish. First thing we know, not only are we taking the tithe, which is God's, but we find ourselves getting more selfish, living for ourselves. And pretty soon you're so miserable and unhappy. A selfish person is a miserable person. A selfish person is jealous, suspicious. He doesn't trust God. He doesn't trust people. He doesn't trust himself. He doesn't have faith in people. People, you pay an awful price for not tithing because you pay it in jealousy, in suspicion, and in selfishness. The same is true if you break the Sabbath. If you compromise the Lord's day, you'll lose. You'll lose. You say, but I can make more money. You can make more money, but you've lost reverence. You've lost reverence for God. If you lose reverence for the Sabbath day, you lose reverence for something else that belongs to God. First thing you know, you've lost your reverence for other things that are sacred in life, right? People, you lose when you compromise. You have to stand true. If you can't make as much money, don't work anyway. Don't break the Sabbath day because God will take care of you. In fact, I believe you'll get a better job in Sabbath. And if you tithe, you can take the nine dimes out of the dollar from which you gave one dime to God's work, and the nine dimes will go farther, buy more, bring you more happiness than the ten dimes would had you kept them all. That's a fact. If you compromise the law of honesty and you tell lies, this universe is not built to accommodate a lie. You tell a lie and you have to tell another lie. And one lie requires another lie. And the first thing you know, you have become a liar. And no liar shall inherit the kingdom of God. Revelation 22. People, you compromise something and you lose what you compromise to get. In fact, you lie to somebody to make them love you, to make them like you. They'll find out about it sooner or later and turn against you. I don't believe it's possible to fool anybody. They may act like it and they say, well, they got the wool pulled over their eyes, but you don't know what people think all the time. People think a lot of things they don't say. You, you compromise. You go ahead and break the laws of God and you're going to lose. If you bow, you are burned. But if you refuse to bow, you can't burn. If you tell the truth and they turn against you for it, as sure as you live, they'll turn back for you before it's over. Some of us are so determined that everybody must agree with us at all times until we compromise to get their approval. But we must be right and stand for what's right regardless of what people say, and in the long run, we're going to win. These young men said, Old King, we may burn, but we won't bow. And the old king got so mad, he almost blew a fuse. He said, Bring me the strongest men I've got in my army. They brought some big, broad-shouldered, deep-chested men out there and grabbed these boys up to throw them in, and these big fellows got too close to the fire, and because they weren't made out of the right kind of stuff, the fire burned them up. And who were they? They were the ones who had bowed to the king, and they burned. And so they finally got enough reinforcements and threw these boys in the burning, fiery furnace and shut the door. Life's fiery furnaces. This world is full of Nebuchadnezzars and fire furnaces and demanding situations. There are life's furnaces everywhere. Sometimes it comes in the guise of sickness. Sometimes it comes in the guise of betrayal of our friendship. Sometimes it comes in the guise of losing what little material things we have in the world. Sometimes it comes in the guise of some lie a person is told. But life is full of fire furnaces. You've got to know if you're on the right side. Are you listening to me, folks? Life is full of fire furnaces. You might as well get prepared for them. Know which side you're on and stay on that side, refusing to bow, standing upon your feet. Well, they burned. At least they thought they were burning. 
Nebuchadnezzar thought they were burning. He had the door shut. He walked out there in front of the furnace and rubbed his hands and said, you know, I'm mighty glad I got these young fellows out of my way. They were getting in my hair. Why, if I'd have let them live, they would have brought a revolution in Babylon. So he stood there waiting for them to be consumed. Pretty soon he said, open the door. They flung the door back and he got as close as he could without getting burned up and he looked in and when he did, his hair stood straight up. He said, counselors, princes, governors, come here quick. They all ran over. He said, look, look. And they looked. He said, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire furnace? They said, that's right. We only put three in there. They were all bound. He said, look, there's four of them in there. They're walking around. They're loose. They have no hurt. And the form of that fourth foot is like the Son of God. The fourth man had come in the urgency of their need. He had come to subdue the crackling flames. He had come to speak to the fire. He had come to deliver them from the burning fiery furnace. Let me give you a resume. When these young men stood on Euphrates banks, Hanging their harps on the willows, saying, How can we sing the songs of our God in a strange land? A thrill went through heaven. When the music sounded, and everybody bowed but these three young men there, and they stood their ground, all heaven was alerted. And when they faced the old king and were demanded to recant or burn, and they said, We may burn, but we won't bow. The fourth man rose from his father's right side, pulled out some divine asbestos suits, flung them across his shoulder and said to the boys, if you'll see to it you don't bow, I'll see to it that you can't burn. (laughs) And when these mighty soldiers picked up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to throw them in and were burned up themselves, the fourth man said, you weren't made out of the right kind of stuff. And folks, it's an awful thing not to be made out of the right kind of stuff. To go to pieces when the going gets rough. Isn't that right? And when they got enough reinforcements and the fourth man saw that this time they'd succeed in throwing them in the burning fiery furnace, he rose up to his full height, leaped into space and time, and faster than speed and light, he sped through the heavens and did not stop until he came inside the roaring, burning furnace. He walked around inside and said to the fire, You shall not burn their bodies, scorch their clothes, or seams their hair. And when they finally threw him in, he was waiting, and they threw him in the fourth man's arms. Glory be to God forever. Who is this fourth man? I'll tell you who the fourth man is. In Genesis, he is the seed of the woman. In Exodus, the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, our high priest. In Numbers, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, the prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, the captain of our salvation. In Judges, our judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, our kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, our trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, our reigning king. In Ezra, our faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, the rebuilder of the broken down walls of human life. In Esther, our Mordecai. In Job, our day spring on high. And our ever living redeemer, for I know that my redeemer liveth. Who is this fourth man? I'll tell you who he is. In Psalms, he's the Lord our shepherd. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, he is our wisdom. In the Song of Solomon, he's the lover and the bridegroom. In Isaiah, the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, the righteous branch. In Lamentations, the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, the wonderful four-faced man. And in Daniel, the fourth man, the burning fiery furnace. Who is this fourth man? In Hosea, he's the faithful husband, forever married to the backslider. In Joel, the baptizer with the Holy Ghost and fire. In Amos, our burden bearer, and Obadiah, the mighty to save. In Jonah, our great foreign missionary. In Micah, the messenger of beautiful feet. In Nahum, the avenger of God's elect. In Habakkuk, God's evangelist. Angelus crying, Revive thy work in the midst of the years. In Zephaniah, he is the Savior. In Haggai, the restorer of God's lost heritage. In Zechariah, the fountain opened up in the house of David for sin and uncleanness. And in Malachi, the son of righteousness rising with healing in his wings. Who 
is this fourth man? In Matthew, he's the Messiah. In Mark, the wonder worker. In Luke, the son of man. In John, the son of God. In Acts, the Holy Ghost. In Romans, our justifier. Corinthians, our sanctifier. In Galatians, he is the redeemer from the curse of the law. In Ephesians, the Christ of unsearchable riches. In Philippians, the God who supplies all our needs. In Colossians, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. First and second Thessalonians, he is our soon coming king. In first and second Timothy, our mediator between God and man. In Titus, our faithful pastor in Philemon, a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. In Hebrews, the blood of the everlasting covenant. In James, the great physician. First and second Peter, the chief shepherd who soon shall appear with a crown of unfading glory. In first, second, third John, he is love. In Jude, the Lord coming with ten thousands of his saints. In Revelation, the king of kings and lord of lords. Who is this fourth man? I'll tell you who he is. He's Abel's sacrifice, Noah's rainbow, Abraham's ram, Isaac's wells, Jacob's ladder, Issachar's burdens, Judah's scepter, Balaam's Shiloh, Moses' rod, Elijah's mantle, Elisha's staff, Gideon's fleece, Samuel's horn of oil, David's slingshot, Isaiah's fig pole, Hezekiah's sundial, Peter's shadow, Paul's handkerchief's and apron, Stephen's signs and wonders, John's pearly white city. Who is this fourth man? He's a husband to the widow, a father to the orphan, to those of us who travel the dark night. He's the bright and morning star. To those who go through the lonesome valley, he's a lily of the valley, the rose of sharing the staff of life and honey in the rock. Who is this fourth man? He's a rock in the weary land. He is the pearl of great price. He is the everlasting father and the government of our life is upon his shoulder. Who is this fourth man? He is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of the living God. And they said we put three in there, but they're poor, they're loose, they're walking about, they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Oh, my brother, the fourth man came in the last moment. He subdued the crackling flames. He commanded the fire not to burn. They refused to bow. Now they can't burn. The fourth man stands by them. If you don't bow, you cannot burn. God will not let you burn when you don't bow. God will stand by you. You became responsible to to God. He became responsible for you. In your responsibility to him, you receive his responsibility in your behalf. If you believe it, say amen. amen. The old king came up and cried, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come forth and come hither. When they came out, he smelled of their garments. There was no fire, no smell of fire, no scorch, and no singe. People, God didn't put them in the furnace, but he sure took them out. He didn't stoke that furnace, but he did subdue the crackling flames of their power. God had nothing to do with their entering. He had all to do with their coming out. God Almighty was not responsible for what the king did, but he was responsible to them because they believed in their God. Not only that, they were freer in the furnace than they were outside the furnace. They were loose inside. They were walking around. They were bound on the outside because they wouldn't bow, but now they're loose. The old king could do one thing, he could put them in. But once he put them in, his evil ended. That's all he could do. There's just so much that men can do to us, and that's all. Nothing else Nebuchadnezzar could do but stand by and watch while the fourth man paraded that bunch inside the furnace. Glory to God forevermore. Not even the smell of fire was on their garments. He smelled of their clothes. No fire smell. Did you know there's only one thing left in the world that's indestructible, that cannot be destroyed? Faith in God. Now you've got to make up your mind which way you're going. If you want to get right with God, come back to God, get this faith in your heart, you will never burn. You cannot burn, brother, when you got this and refuse to bow. But you will burn if you bow that knee. If you compromise with the world, you will burn. Listen to this now. The old king smelled of them and saw that there was no fire smell or singe or scorch, and he cried that God's angel had come and spared his children and taken care of them. And then he made a decree. He saw that there was no God in the world like Jehovah God. 
And he made a decree. He called his secretary and he said, Now write these words. I am Nebuchadnezzar, king of the earth. Have you got that? Yes. Well, write this. That I make a law. All nations, kindreds, and tongues on the earth. You got that? Yes. That if any man speak any word amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his house shall be torn down and made a dunghill. He shall be cut in pieces himself. Have you got that? Yes. One more thing. For there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. People, the thing I'm about to say is the greatest thing of all. If you forget everything else I've said, don't forget this. I end this sermon by this statement. There is no other God except the Lord Jesus, the fourth man. There is no other God that can deliver like this. Let every head be bowed, please. Every head bowed. Heavenly Father, I realize tonight that I have preached to the souls of men and probed their souls. I realize tonight that God's in this place and your spirit is dealing with human lives. And now, Father, grant me this miracle tonight in Jesus' name and according to thy will in heaven. Please, dear God, don't let a mother's boy who heard me preach tonight go to hell. Don't let a mother's girl who heard me preach tonight go to hell. Don't let a daddy, don't let a mother who heard me preach tonight go to hell. But please, dear God, give them thy forgiveness for their many sins and the peace of Christ for their lonely, lonely souls. Grant it, Lord, without the loss of a single one in this great audience tonight. Read at verse 14. This is some of the most powerful parts of the Word of God. It has a wallop and a punch. It has a tremendous power, a force, a driving force for our lives. Listen as I read. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if ye be ready, at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? You can hear the sneer in his voice. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. But if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He had a pretty healthy respect for these boys, didn't he? And then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They weren't made out of the right kind of stuff. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said to his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. 
Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors, being gathered together, saw these men, upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their head seams, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other god that can deliver after this sort. Let every head be bowed, please. Thank you. Heavenly Father, with all the reverence and faith of my soul tonight, I come in the presence of the Lord God Almighty. I come not in my name, but in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, thine only begotten Son. Honor now the ministry and the prayer of thy humble servant, and grant this mighty miracle tonight, the presence and the power of God to set men free. Fill this great auditorium from roof to floor, wall to wall, with the power of Jesus of Nazareth. O oh Lord, rebuke the devil's power. Cast out demon spirits. Subdue the wicked forces that bind and torment humanity. And set the people free. O oh God. God rebuke Satan's awful power. And now, devil, I come against you tonight, not in my strength or in my name, but in the strength and through the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I charge you, devil, take your hands off God's property and loose every man, every woman, every child in this great audience. Loose them, devil. I charge you by my Lord, loose them and let them go free. God cast him out. Fill this auditorium with the angels of God. Oh, may they walk these aisles tonight. May they hold us in their hands, O oh Lord. May this be the hour when the presence of God shall take this campaign over. God, let people be healed while I preach. Let people be saved while I preach. Let people's habits be broken while I preach. And, O oh Lord, destroy the works of the devil and set people free tonight. Now, Father, I thank you because you've heard me pray, because I come in the name that's above every name, the mighty and comparable name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of the living God. Amen. I speak to you tonight on the fourth man. Like a sparkling diamond on a velvet couch, the city of Jerusalem was situated by God the exact geographical center of this earth. There he dwelt among his people. There they builded a temple for his glory and honor and worship. On its altars were sacrificed animals, pure and without blemish. Their blood shed an offering made for the forgiveness of the people's sins. Through the streets of Jerusalem walked the old prophets of God, thundering their prophecies, uttering their messages of truth, calling their people back to the paths of holiness and righteousness before God. From Jerusalem, you have got to understand one thing if you want to make a success of your faith. You are not going to have an easy time with the devil. You are not going to have an easy time with the devil. You are not going to have an easy time with the devil. A young lady got up one night and came down the aisles in our meeting and gave her heart to Jesus Christ. She was flushed with joy. Her face shone like the face of an angel. She went back and sat down beside her boyfriend and took his hand and said, The Lord has just saved me. I never knew what it was until tonight to be saved. And I want you to come with me and give your heart to Jesus too. And he up and laughed in her face. She didn't know what to expect from him. She thought that he would want to come. 
And she was astonished to find that he was mocking her. And he sat there and poked fun at her. Every time she'd ask him to come, he'd mock her. Finally, she saw that he meant it. And she knew she had something in her heart that the world couldn't give and the world couldn't take away. And she turned to him and said, All right, if you won't go to heaven with me, I'm not going to hell with you. I received quite a bit of mail from people whose loved ones get saved in my meetings, some of whom go back and backslide. A lot of people get saved in every revival. That's all right if they happen to die during a revival. But if they were to die between revivals, most of them would lose their souls. But some of these people come up, especially some men who are in and out and who have worried their wives all these years, their wives begging them to get right and stay right, and their wives being a crutch to them and holding them up and hoping and praying that they'll stand true this time. I received a letter from a certain lady who said, Brother Roberts, my husband's been saved so many times, she said. In and out, and he came to your meeting and got saved, and I thought, sure, this time he'd stay saved. And he did for a few months. But now he's got cold and won't go to church and, and won't pay his tithes and won't pray and doesn't get much out of life anymore. Brother Roberts, I was thinking if you'd let him join your party and travel with you that he'd probably stay saved. And I thought to myself, my brother, sister, I need somebody with me who's a soldier, not a coward. I need somebody up here on the firing line where the bullets are whizzing by and the bombs are bursting who's got faith in God, who will stand when the going gets rough. And furthermore, if the man doesn't live right at home, he won't live right abroad. If you can't stay saved in your own church, you probably won't stay saved in the middle of this great campaign. Religion is not a thing of environment, it's a thing of the heart. Religion is an experience with God, something you feel, something you know you've got, something that you experience yourself. It's a set of principles. It's a deep power within your own spirit that connects you with God. It's your own decision to go to heaven. It's your decision to choose God over the devil, faith over unbelief. Salvation over sin, heaven over hell, faith over fear. Yes, power over strength, joy over sadness, love over hate. Religion is a choice, a concocted, a terrible plan so that he would know whether or not people were worshiping him. At the sound of music throughout all the world, people were to bow and face themselves toward the image of Nebuchadnezzar clasp their hands, chant this praise, great is Nebuchadnezzar our God, great is Nebuchadnezzar our God. There was one city and one land untouched by the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, the land of Judea where Jerusalem was. One day he took his conquering legion and marched across the hot burning sands of the desert and besieged the city of God the great king. In process of time with their old battering rams, they tore the walls down, went inside and burned the temple, sacked the city and left it in smoldering ruins. As trophies of his victory, he led away captive the very flower of the nation, fine young Hebrew men like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, and others. See these young men. As they stand on one of the hills overlooking their ruined city and hear them say, O oh, Jerusalem, O oh, Jerusalem, if we ever forget thee, let our right hand forget its cunning, let our tongue cleave to the roof of our mouths. See them again as they pass inside the walls of the fabulous city of Babylon. See them as they gather on the banks of Euphrates River and hang their harps on the willows and hang their heads in sorrow. See the curious Babylonians as they come to gaze upon them and hear them say, Sing for us some of the songs of Zion. Play for us on your instruments. And hear these melancholy words, How can we sing the songs of our God in a strange land? And they refuse to do it. But hardly had they become accustomed to the splendor of their new surroundings until they heard all kinds of music, trumpets and cornets and flutes and what have you, and to their astonishment, every Babylonian they saw and stranger in town was bowing on his face and chanting praises, Great is Nebuchadnezzar our God! Seeing the reflection of the golden image, 
their blood record in their veins. For written in the law of God, thou shalt not bow down to any graven image. Thou shalt not worship any idol god. And these young men stood still, their blood freezing in their veins, standing upright with their face toward God in his heaven. There were informers, spies in the land. They came to the king and told him a story who ushered these young men in his presence and demanded them either to fall down and worship his image or he would cast them alive into a burning, fiery furnace. And he said, then who will be that God that will deliver you out of my hands? These young men came face to face with one of life's inescapable facts. True religion will be tried. A man who is going to heaven is going to face some opposition along the way. A man who is living for God will be hated by the devil. His religion will be tried. Friends, Jerusalem went the law of God to the ends of the earth, and there his name was praised and honored and glorified. Far away from Jerusalem, toward the south and east, was another city, the greatest the pride and skill of man have ever built. Babylon was built on a great mountain of rock. Its walls were 300 feet high and wide enough at the top for eight chariots to run races side by side. Inside the walls was the famous heathen temple, Bel, whose spires towered above the walls 300 feet, and on its altars were offered animals to appease the wrath of heathen gods. And once the animals had been strangled to death, offered on the altars of the temple to heathen gods, the meat was sold to the butchers of Babylon, who in turn sold it to cost the counter to the Babylonian housewives. This explains why Daniel and his companions put their foot down, pushed their plate back, got up and said, We will not defile ourselves with the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank, because their religion forbade their eating meat which had come from an animal strangled to death and whose body had been offered to idol gods. Winding its way through Babylon was the beautiful Euphrates River, which added much to the wondrous beauty of Babylon. Here also was built the famous Hanging Gardens, one of the wonders of the ancient world, which Nebuchadnezzar built for the pride and vanity of his worldly wife. Here was the famous palace of Nebuchadnezzar, the proudest man who ever sat on an earthly throne. This palace was eight or seven miles around, being more like a fortress than a palace. Nebuchadnezzar had taken his victorious armies and marched across the known earth and captured the nations of the world. He had brought back to Babylon many of its people, and in consequence of his wars he had brought their gods. For what was strange to Nebuchadnezzar was the weakness and the utter lack of power of the gods of this world. They were made in the likeness of four-footed beasts some in the likeness of the fowls of the air, some in the likeness of men, some grotesque and ugly and crude, others brilliant and beautiful and skillfully made. But none of them had power to deliver their people. And once Nebuchadnezzar had captured the people, he also captured their gods and brought them back to Babylon with him. He had a vast stockpile of gods, gods of every known description, but gods who could not see, nor hear, nor feel, nor had no power to set their people free. And so when he saw all these gods lifeless laying at his feet, he said, there's no god in the world but me. No god could withstand my march, my relentless power. So he had his men to fashion a golden image a reproduction of himself, his own image, of pure and solid gold. It stood a hundred feet high at the edge of the city on the plains of Dura. And when he saw that this god was made 